I'm really happy to introduce today's speaker, um, Dr. Jie Zhang from George Mason University. So here's just a short bio. Um, Jie got his uh, bachelor's degree in astronomy from Nanjing University in 1990, and then he got his PhD in astrophysics um, from the University of Maryland in 1999. And after that, he did a postdoc um, at the Naval Research Lab, lab from 2000 to 2002, and then he became, um, he joined the faculty as an assistant professor at George Mason University in 2005, and then he's been there ever since, and now he's just been promoted to a uh, full professor um, a, a month ago. So today he'll, uh, he's been working on observation and modeling of coronal mass ejection, solar flare, so he will talk about it today. Uh, thank you, Yihong. And uh, you know, Sarah, she's supposed to be my official host, but you know, she cannot be here. She apologized to me. I said, oh, it's fine. It's, it's your day, actually. It's not my day. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to talk about this uh, CME flare stuff, you know, solar eruptions, and observationally. And uh, mostly, I will be concentrating on observations, and a little bit on the uh, physical mechanisms. Um, before I uh, go to my talk, I want to do a little bit of advertisement about the space weather program at George Mason University. You know, we have a space weather lab over there, uh, which is within the School of Physics, Astronomy, and Computational Sciences. And here is a list of the faculty. You know, we have four teaching faculty. Um, uh, me is on the solar physics, and uh, Bob Weigel is on the magnetosphere, and Otto Igit, and also Michael Summers is on the uh, sorry. Uh, Bob Weigel is on the magnetosphere, and Erdo Igit and uh, Michael Summers is on the uh, ionosphere and, uh, and the neutral atmosphere. So basically, it's, we have faculty um, concentrate in areas all the way from the sun to the earth, so can address the entire sun to earth chain of action um, for space weather uh, purpose. And so the program is, is, is growing. Uh, it was first created in 19, sorry, 2003. It has been 10 years. I think it's, it's, it's going well. Uh, now let's go back to my talk. Uh, so first, I will give an introduction to flares and CMAs in general, with a focus on the possible relations between CMAs and the flares. Secondly, I will talk about the, uh, the, the flares uh, with a concentration on the ideas of magnetic reconnection. The third one is on the topic of CMEs and with uh, focus on the so-called concept of magnetic flux loops. And many of you here are familiar with the magnetic flux loops, I think. Um, finally, some conclusion and discussions. As you know, there are two kinds of the solar eruptions, uh, mostly in the flares uh, is one of them. Here is the, uh, the flare observations by the ghost uh, to have the solar X-ray imager. Uh, you can see a lot of flares going on. This is one day observation uh, of the last solar maximum. Uh, there are a lot of flares going on every day. So on the right side is the uh, Lasco uh, CD chronograph. You can see also a lot of CMs going on. Typically, in the solar maximum, there are about 10 flares every day and uh, five CMEs every day. But in solar minimum, of course, the number of CMEs and the flares are lower but still, you do, you do have, have those flares in the CMEs almost every day. And occasionally, uh, when the, the direction is right, you know, the CME and the flare direction is right, you know, they can affect the Earth, causing space weather. Uh, and also, I don't mention the filament. I, not, I also know that filament prominence is, is, is an important part of the whole eruption. But in, in this case, I treat the uh, filament or prominence as a part of the CME. So, so I, will I will focus on mostly on flares and CMEs, but not the filament in, in my talk. Can you, can you yes. The the flare here it, it strictly means the uh, the electromagnetic radiation. But that could, in that case, I would tell you that there are many more than you have on your histogram. Because if you're going to go down to like an A level flare. Uh, oh yeah. Okay. Here is just the, all the, the the number here. This histogram over here. Is is just a list of all the ghost, 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 ghost it's flares. Above the is yes, is above integrated background. So in the solar minimum is above A level, okay. in the solar maximum is about a C level. Okay. So those are the numbers okay. uh, from the ghost list. The ghost yes. Yep. Um, and is there a duration involved too? If it's an impulsive flare, is that included? 
everything, every flare in the ghost list uh, is included in, in the list here. Um, so here the, are the uh, association between CMEs and the flares. Uh, CMEs and the flares, they do occur separately. You know, flare can occur you know, without a CME. CME can occur without a flare. But uh, very often, they're associated. Here is the, the, the rough association rate between CMEs and the flares. Uh, you can see for the X-class flares, uh, about 90% of them are associated with C CMEs. Only 10, but still 10% of X-class flares, the largest sort of flares, they don't have CME. They are confined, so a confined flare or compact flares. So they are not associated with CME. Uh, if you go down to the middle level, the M-class flares, about 50 and 50. So 50% 50 of the flares are associated with CMEs, but 50% of them are, are compact or confined. But if you go to C-class flares, most of them <coughs> are just flares, not CMEs. So they are related, but they are, they are different. So here is the uh, give you uh, some kind of food for thought um, be uh, before I move on. Uh, this is a quote from Richard Harrison um, in his 1995 paper. Uh, what he said is, flares and CMEs are signatures of the same magnetic disease. That is, they represent the response in different parts of the magnetic structure to a particular activity. Secondly, they do not drive one another, but are closely related. So this is just some idea. But I, I think I agree with the most part, most, almost, almost everything of his, this, these two statements over here. In particular, I believe they do not drive one another, but are closely associated. And also, they are response of different parts of the magnetic structure. On the other hand, I have to be very careful with what's the so-called same magnetic disease. You have to be more specific. What kind of magnet magnetic disease you want to talk about? Because this is a physical mechanism which are responsible for either flares and CMEs. So I will get into that. So we'll focus on the, either the idea of reconnection and the idea of the flux loop. Um, so, First, let me examine the, how they are closely associated. So here is the, uh, um, the time profiles of the, um, of the flare. This is the ghost X-ray profile for one particular event. Here is the height time of the uh, CME. So this is uh, the bottom one. The black line, black solid line is the ghost X-ray profile. And the, uh, the, this symbol line here, dotted line, is the CME velocity. And for one event, for the other event, by another person, by Gallagher, the, the CME height, velocity, acceleration, goes X-ray. So this is, again, this is by Tamer, Manuela. And the, the flare, sorry, CME height, velocity, and acceleration. The red one here is the hard X-ray uh, profile. So they, they, you know, before the uh, Soho era, uh, say 1980s, people thought about the, the flares and the CME are kind of randomly related. You know, the CME onset can be before the flare onset, after flare onset. However, after the Soho observations, you know, one thing is, is getting clear is that CME onset and the flare onset, if they're associated, they're almost always at the same time. Okay, they're not. So you don't see a flare, a flare occurs way ahead of the CME or after CME. They always occur at the same time. But let me be more specific. That is, can be summarized in this picture. We could say that the temporary evolution of the CMEs and the flares are almost synchronized, so, or almost synchronized. So the, the flare profile is like this a red one, the red curve over here. So this is a rising phase or, or the rising phase of the flare. This is a decay phase of the flare in ghost soft X-ray. And so the rising phase of the flare is corresponds to the main energy release phase of the magnetic reconnection. And, but for CME, it's a little bit more complicated. For CME, typically it has, for many of them, uh, they have three phases. The, in the middle one is a, is, a, is a very fast acceleration phase corresponding to impulsive acceleration of CMEs. And then after that is kind of constant, you know, or a small change of the velocity. And uh, this middle part, you know, the impulsive acceleration of CME is always coincide with the beginning of the flare and, and, and also roughly the peak time of the flare. Always 
It's always a strong word, yes, I agree. You know, you can find some exceptions, but in many cases, we have studied right. so far. You said earlier that not all CMEs have flares. Not all CMEs are not, not all, not all CMEs have flares, but if they are associated, they do have this kind of relationship. For many of them. This is active region CMEs. Um, but one thing about the CMEs particularly is that there is an initiation, it's called initiation phase or slow rising phase. Before the onset of the flare, you can see some structure rise up slowly, lasting for like 10 minutes or 20 minutes. Uh, that is before the onset of the flare. So that tells, tells you something. Something is going on even before the uh, onset of the flare or sets in because the flare, you know, means the uh, the uh, the fast reconnection. I'll talk about it later. So before before the flare sets in or reconnection sets in, something has already happening in the active region or in the corona. So that is some kind of indication of the activity from the flux zone. Um, but in any case, you know, the the the, the ultimate answer lies in how well we understand, we understand or know the magnetic fields, both observationally and theoretically. But that's a difficult part of our sort of physics, right? We, for, the, for the magnetic field, observationally, we don't know how the corner field look like. That would be, I guess, you know, the, the research, task, research task for cosmos, such, such, as, such a telescope. You know. If we want to get down to the bottom of this business, we have to know the corner magnetic field observationally. Theoretically, do we understand the magnetic field very well? I don't think so. For example, reconnection is not a way understood. How, do, how the reconnection can be triggered you know, from slow to fast, and what triggers the reconnection, and how they form, many things are unclear. Same thing for the, uh, the CMEs. So magnetic holds the key. So this video here shows the, uh, the one of the very most complex act region is emerging um, that you can see the data sunspot, um, a data, data configuration over here. And uh, actually, you know, if we do 3D, the, the 3D um, rendition, we can find out this actually corresponding to the emerging of two bipoles. And these two bipoles are, are con con colliding with each other and, 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 and are rising up and colliding with each, each other. Some people say, OK, this complex active region can be caused by uh, you know, a twisted data configuration rise up. But uh, we would say this is just you know, two bipoles. The, each bipole is twisted. Then they just rise up, and they, then they just move toward each other in the middle part of it. So there are many controversial things about a magnetic field. Um, so that's the uh, interesting thing about a sort of physics research. We don't know much about a magnetic field yet. Um, so here is, this is my, my introduction. Um, now let me move on to the second topic, uh, flares uh, and the magnetic reconnection. I think this is less controversial. That is, you know, for flares, uh, it's commonly believed that the physical mechanism of solar flares is a magnetic reconnection. And uh, the, you know, the idea is that magnetic field you know, is compressed toward a, a small area. Then you're able to have the flux dissipation. And otherwise, because of extremely small uh, resistivity in the corona because of low density of the corona plasma, the resistivity area is very small. The flux <coughs> dissipation is unlikely. It's a very slow process. But but if you're able to uh, have kind of you know this kind of inflow of the opposite magnetic field toward a, a region, so-called current sheet, then you may end up with the uh, the dissipation of the flux. Then you can also introduce the uh, the, the 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 electric field that accelerate the particles. And also, you can trigger something called maybe the uh, the anomalous uh, anomalous uh, instability to uh, sorry anomalous instability of this eta here just in increase the resistivity of the plasma combined with the strong current. You have this kind of you know, fast energy release, and the this idea was um, invented in about 50 years ago, and the successes of this magnetic reconnection mechanisms are. First, you know, it can explain the very fast dissipation of magnetic energy. That's, that's important for flares, because flare ha happens in minutes, right? So, f though the, the reconnection can, pr can produce a mechanism, can have a fast dissipation of magnetic energy. The other one, the flare is a natural accelerator of non-thermal particles, because of 
the induction of the electric field. So it's a natural accelerator for energetic particles. If you put the reconnection idea into the, uh, the solar flare context, uh, this is the uh, so-called standard flare model, has been going on for many, many years. It's a combination of different ideas, but essentially, the standard flare model is a bipolar magnetic configuration, is a bipolar, uh, with a core. The core could be prominence of filament. The core rises, and then the rise of the core can trigger the reconnection underneath. So this is the idea of the standard flare model, is a bipolar, the core rises, and then trigger the reconnection. And this is how the reconnection is triggered in the standard model. Uh, it's called a CSHKP model. Um, the, the standard flare model successfully explains several observational phenomena, uh, such as separation motion of flare ribbons uh, in the chromosphere and the transition region, such as rising uh, post eruption loop arcade in the corona, loop hot x rays, loop top hot x ray sources, and x ray gradual decay phase. So, just to you one example about the st standard flare model and its observations. So, this is the uh, um, the uh, one of the SDO observations of of a flare, I think this fits the uh, the standard flare model um, very nicely. You can see, could you could you turn off the uh, the, the light? You can see the you know the the multiple the multiple uh, observational phenomena just mentioned, including the here is the uh, by the way just quickly. So this is the SDO AIA um, different temperature, the one million. On um, 1.5 million degree, this is the 3 million degree, 10 million degree. This is the transition region, the AI 1600 Angstrom. Uh, for the for the transition region, you can see the, the the foot point over here, the ribbons. This is the magnetic field. Um, you can see the multiple things. You know, the um, the ribbon, the the flare ribbon is over here. So this is the foot point of the ribbon. And then you can see the post eruption loop arcade and, and it, ri it rises. So the standard flare model is a bipole, um, can explain the most of the flare phenomena. So it's very nice. So the so I think this is a more or less is a, is, is an easy case for solar physicists. You know, we assume we understand the solar flares. Um, so here's a short, a short summary. So a flare is driven by magnetic reconnection, and uh, the topology required for the magnetic field is a strong current sheet. And how to create the pre-flare current sheet? There are many ways. You know, there are a lot of papers. I don't have a, a list of papers over here, but there are many, so many papers about different ways of creating the current sheet. You know, you know, if you can have a shield arcade uh, before the eruption, you can still produce the the, the flare current sheet. You can have the flux loop before eruption can still create the current sheet, or even you have flux emergence can create a current sheet. So there are many ways to create a current sheet. So that's not a, not an issue for the for the flares for the current sheet to produce. One time yes. Ago, I think there are people who might not have created it, mm -hmm. but understand flares. And it's a question also where in the corona is the reconnection occurring, mm -hmm. um, and then the decay phase where things then are. How, how do you explain the decay phase? Of Oh yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah, but I think in the relatively flare. The basic picture you described. I think you know there's not much controversy uh, about the flare mechanism and the picture. So, but I will get into the, the next one. CME is more controversy. So, so the focus on my, my talk will be on the CME um, and also the idea of the magnetic flux soaps. So. Uh, for CME, I think it's a more controversial topic uh, than flare because CME is more geoeffective, CME is more energetic, and CME is also uh, uh, is less understood because of the relatively new observations. And flare has been around for 150 years, CME is only about 50 years. So, the the if we talk about CMEs, you know, we can kind of get away from the idea of flux soap. So uh, let me give you an introduction of the flux of idea first. So the magnetic flux of idea actually actually is not came originally came from solar physics. It came from the uh, the heliospheric physics. The people were doing solar wind study in situ. So in 1981, you know, Dan Berger, um, 
they use the in situ observations helio two to find out an interesting phenomena is called a magnetic cloud, which has the in solar wing this is solar wing uh, observation the the magnetic field uh, the angle of the magnetic field um, temperature density. What they found is that the the, the in, the, in some transients in a sort of wing, that uh, the magnetic field is enhanced. It's larger than the ambient sort of wing field. And also, when the magnetic field is enhanced, interesting thing is that they become more smooth, and also become you know have a syst systematic rotation of the magnetic field in a sort of wing. So it's called a magnetic cloud. Then this cloud is modeled by the the, uh, the force free. Um, this solution is a force-free um, flux loop solution, a cylindrical, a cylindrical flux loop. So this solution can fit the observation very well. And conceptually, because the flux loop has to be connected to the sun, so in this local portion could be approximated by a cylinder, but in global sense, it's more like this. The two foot points con still connecting back to the source region of the CME. But in the larger scale, it's, it's look like this. It's helical field lines wrapping around uh, the axis. The more recently, uh, the, uh, the CME observations go now near the sun. The, uh, there are some evidence about flux of, especially you know, the uh, last observations show that the helical, helical structure in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the CME eruption in white light. And this kind of helical structure and also including this kind of three, so called three part uh, morphology of CME, the leading front, the bright leading front, the cavity, and a core, a bright core over here, can be modeled by the flux model. This is a this is the modeling by Jim Chen. You know, the he can model the the overall three part structure of a CME using this kind of flux idea. So, so generally, there's no argument that. After the eruption, after the eruption, the CME is a flux loop. So this is a, I think is a, this is a commonly accepted. After the eruption, the CME is a flux loop. But the problem is that the, the controversial thing is that what's happening before the eruption? Is it before the eruption? Is a flux loop or not? Uh, in other words, there are kind of two paradigms that explain the CME eruption. The, the older one, or original one, is that the, the CME is driven by magnetic reconnection. Uh, that is, you know, you can explain CME using the standard flare model, and there are many variants over there. Um, and in this case, if you use standard model, standard flare model to explain CMEs, then in this context, the CME is a byproduct of magnetic reconnection in the current sheet. And the it, then in the configuration of the magnetic field is basically is a shield arcade converts to flux loop. So if the standard standard flare model is, is right, the the other paradigm or a, a competing one is which is relatively new is that the CME is driven by flux loop eruption. The difference is that before the eruption, the the key structure is not a current sheet. The key structure is a fully developed magnetic flux loop sitting in the corona, and in this case, you don't need a re reconnection. The ideal MHD instability uh, will do. And I'll, I'll explain this later. So you don't need a reconnection. The ideal MHD process should, uh, should, should be able to drive the flux out, produce CME. In this case, I would say reconnection is a byproduct of the flux loop eruption and expansion. So those are totally two different scenarios. So I don't know which one we believe, but let me let me show, let me show uh, some of my uh, the evidence over here. I would prefer the second one, but I know this is a pretty controversial. Um, first, let me explain what's the difference between the flux loop and uh, the current sheet. Uh, essentially, the flux loop is a three D in nature. Okay, the current sheet is two D in nature. So in order to model the CME, have to go 3D. Otherwise, the flux loop cannot be modeled. In, cannot cannot be cannot be uh, modeled. But the current sheet is different. A 2D model should be sufficient. And I would say uh, the flux loop is 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 a structure that magnetic field lines twisted around a central axis. There are at least one four turn of twist from one end to the other end. 
um, and also it's 3D in nature. Uh, in Fluxo, uh, it also contains current, electric current, but this current is, is a, a three-dimensional kind of channel. Unlike in the, uh, the current sheet, it's kind of a, a two, in topology, the two-dimensional sheet. But in this one, it's, it's a, the three-dimensional channel. So current carrying situation is different between the flux loop and the current sheet. Um, so if you have a magnetic flux loop in the corona, assuming that for now, so what is the physical mechanism drives the flux loop to erupt? The idea is simple. Uh, this is by the Jim Chen in 1999. Um, that is, if you have a magnetic flux loop, the, it's intrinsically unstable because the flux loop can be described by this formula. It has many forces acting on the flux loop, but the most important force is so-called a hoop force, or the curvature force, or called Lorentz self force. It's basically is a is a is a is a, is a current in the current channel, the J multiplied by the B, J cross B. This force, the J cross B force, inside of the flux loop is naturally is pointing outward, and it's balanced by this term is balanced by the overlying, overlying field. The overlying field is called a strapping effect, is, 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 is keep the flux loop down. And so it's in balance between the, uh, the, the Lorentz self force or hoop force and the overlying strapping force. However, in 2006, uh, the idea of the torus instability came in. The, the torus instability says that, well, you have a flux loop, it's fine can be in balance. However, if you keep injecting the helicity or the poloidal flux into the flux loop, what happens is that flux loop will increase the height because it has to expand when you inject flux into it. It goes higher to higher and higher in the corona. You still can keep the balance. For you, if you inject the flux a little bit, then it rises up from a new, new balance position. However, there's a critical point, critical height. Uh, is that if the, at this particular height, if the magnetic field decreases so fast, that means as the flux will rise up, both the strapping force of overlying field and also the flux of the hoop, hoop force, both are decreasing. However, if we go to this critical height, the, the decreasing of the overlying field is faster than, than the decreasing of the, uh, the hoop force. Then the flux loop cannot find a cannot find uh, the uh, a balance point anymore. It will become erupt. So this is a critical gradient index, which is is the is is the magnetic field decrease respect to the height in the log scale. If it's 1.5, it's become unstable. And uh, and uh, you know we have tested this idea on um, using Jim Chen's formula, and we found that that's the same. Even though Jim does not agree that you know his eruptive flux model is consistent with the torus instability, but we used his formula and, uh, and just, you know, let the, form let the formula to, to, to evolve, eventually find out the inst instability point over here. So the, so the James flux model is consistent with the idea of torus instability. So I think basically um, erupting flux loop is not an issue here. Now the key question is that, is there observational evidence that a flux loop exists before the eruption? That's a controversial part because ultimately you have to be examined by observers to test the idea. So I have looked into these issues. Um, the, there are many things can be treated as flux loop, but it's controversial, yes. It's not dip, it's just the flux will be just a, you know, a twisting, a, you have a helical field twisting around a central axis. Right. So is there any limitation, in your definition, is there any critical? It has a four one ton, one ton. I think at least a one ton. So, the, so if it's, if it's, a, if it's a less than one ton, then it's kind of a shield arcade. You don't have the, uh, the hoop, you don't have the hoop force pointing outward. It's well balanced. But it's more than one ton, then the magnetic field is, is partially disconnected. They end up with the, the hoop force. I think one turn probably is critical. But I'm not sure the teaching, so I'm not sure. 
Um, but conceptually, I think, you know, the flux has to have some magnetic field. It's partially disconnected from the corona. Um, so one observation from the HFR, filament in HFR observations. Uh, the question is that, you know, uh, a filament is a flux soup or a filament is a, a part of the flux soup? Well, there, there are many studies on this. You know, some people say, yes, filament is a flux soup. Um, but the other people say, no, though the filament is not a flux soup. Filament is only is, uh, is, is located at the tip of the shield arcade. And some other people say, yes or no, could it be both cases. Uh, so, so this is a filament. Uh, so we cannot, I think, in my opinion, we cannot use filament uh, as a as an indication of a flux soup. A filament can be both a flux soup or non flux soup, depending how the filament uh, evolves. So you cannot just say point it at this filament and say, okay, there's a flux soup over there. That's not possible because there are so many filaments in the corona, um, but only a small part of them eventually become erupted. And the other evidence is corona cavity. You know, I guess people here have studied a lot of the corona cavity. You know, the common thing I think you know people think believe that corona cavity is a flux soup, but they are not in active regions. How about active region field? So active region the shield arcade or flux soup or not? Active region structure. Why is the X-ray sigmoid? So I think this is a strong evidence of the flux soup before the eruption. But also people can say, well, I can have another scenario to explain the sigmoid, which is not a flux soup. There's some paper like this over there. But I think, you know, I, I, I believe that that's the case because sigmoid can be ex explained by this kind of the flux soup model by Titov Demoling. You know, it has a line current, circular current, and the two, bi two, 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 uh, two bipole charges over there. You can model it. Then from this this uh, model, you can you can uh, see that the uh, the 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 quasi separate surface uh, coming from the border patch is like this. From one border patch, the second border patch, you have this kind of separate surface. And this, if we put them together, it form nicely a sigmoidal shape. So basically, the heating of the sig the heating of the sigmoid in, in soft X ray come from the the quasi separate layers. Uh, Associated with the the flux soup, um, but the problem is that when you see the X-ray sigmoid, you cannot observe the continuous uh, continuous transition from a sigmoid to a flux soup. What you see is that you see a sigmoid at one moment, then next time when you see it, it become a flux, it become a post arcade, post eruption arcade. So the X-ray observation is really poor in terms of the Look at the continuous evolution of the sigmoid into the CME. So it's always like you know sigmoid to, to eruption arcade transition. So it's, 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 it's evidence, but it's not very strong. Um, uh, I just want to show you, you know recently we have been using the SDO observations to identify flux soaps, and we found a one interesting phenomenon. It's called an EUV hot channel. Um, I think. This is a very strong evidence of the presence of the flux soup before the eruption. So here's a paper uh, published two years ago. So what we found, before I show the movie, so what we found is that a single coherent structure with fixed foot points in, in, soft, in the EUV, AIA EUV. And also we can see continuous transform from a sigmoid structure into a semicircular loop. And also, this structure is only appear in hot temperatures in AIA one thirty one pass band, and uh, in iron twenty about ten million degree. Does not appear in cool temperatures. Uh, here's a here's one example of the movie. Um, so this is event on the on the I guess is on the uh, March the eighth twenty eleven. And the image here is the AIA. Um, different pass band from core temperature. Uh, 171 is less than 1 million degree. 193 is about 1.5 million degree. Uh, 335 uh, is about, uh, no, this is, I think this is, a, yeah, 335 is about 3 million degree. The AIA 131 is about 10 million degree. This is the, uh, the 1600. This is a mag HMI, magnetogram. This is the uh, ghost X ray. Um, plot. So it's a long duration flare. Uh, it's M class flare. 
the um, so what you can see is that there are the many frames over here. Um, I want to probably let you concentrate on, on this movie, which is the uh, AI 131, 10 million degree. Um, so here's line says is before the flare, onset of the flare, right after the flare. Um, let me probably try to control that if I can. No, I cannot control it from here. Hmm. Then it's hard to catch it. Let's just focus on this one, okay? Focus on this 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 uh, movie over here. So this end of the flare. Let's let let's just wait when it comes when it comes back. Um, so this flare region, the brightening, but then that's the beginning of the flare, before the flare. So nothing over here is just quite act region. Uh, that's nothing. Then what happens? You see something rise up after the immediately after the onset of the flare. It, something sigmoid appear. A sigmoid appears about five minutes before the f onset of the flare. Then, after the onset of flare, this sigmoid transforms into a semicircular shape, then moves out to become a CME. Um, I wish I can control it, but I, I, I can't for some reason. This is an MP4 movie. Um, but I, I was able to control last night. Can you yeah, I can, I can show that. Let me see. There is a movie. This one. So now if I can choose it, and then it's just blocking. Yeah. <laughs> so because the, the, the you know the solution is different, you know when I when I used it in my computer yesterday evening. You know, today, um, just, just, it won't disappear. You can move your cursor away. Okay. It's just uh, I still cannot control it because I otherwise block it. But anyway, uh, just see, you know, uh, at this time, that's onset time of the flare, what you can see from from this region. Uh, let's come back again. Can, can, can I move the bar? Okay, great, great. I, I, okay, got it. So, so that's the before the onset of the flare. Now you can see a, a, a sigmoid starts to form. That's about a few minutes before the flare, you can see the sigmoid. Then the sigmoid slowly rise up. See it? Still doing a slow rise, slow rise phase. That's still before the onset of the flare, before the onset of the impulsive phase. Slow rise. Then you can see the rise up. Now it become to the impulsive phase already. So rise up and convert to a kind of semicircular shape. And it continuously move out to become the CME. So I just uh, show this one, you know, see, you see this concept on this one here? The, the, the onset, before the onset, the, the sigmoid shape appears. But before that, 10 minutes earlier, there's nothing over there. You don't see anything, just like in the core temperature, nothing, nothing over there. But before the eruption, before the onset of the flare, you know, the, you see a sigmoid appears. 
but this sigma does appear in cool temperature, only hot temperature. Then starts to rise up slowly, then become you know, transform into a kind of semicircular shape. Then this one. This sigmoid. Oh, let me let me uh just stop stop it. Yeah, this I would call this sigmoid. You know, it's it rising from here, the elbow, then come down over here, then go back. Yeah, but it, it just had two elbows, you know, the, the foot point is over here and extending this way. The foot point is over here. The foot point doesn't change. The shape, the, the, the corner top, the corner part of the shape changed, but the foot point remained at the same location. That's why I can see the sigmoid, because, you know, the foot point is over here. The other foot point is about over here. You know, this overall shape is like going up, extending out and come down. Then, then, then going inward, inward, then come down again, go down again. Um, okay, so I guess I have to move on. A later on, maybe. Uh, the density is about the ten to the nine. It's not that. Oh, density is higher than the, than the surrounding. A little bit higher than the surrounding. Higher than um, density is similar, I think. Density is similar, and the only difference is temperature. If you compare the density, it's low density because it, it, it don't see it in the uh, in the core temperature. Yeah, yeah. Let me show. You. Here is the highlight highlight of one uh, one particular frame. So this is a one seven zero one core temperature of the one million degree. This is the uh, AIA one thirty one ten million degree. The arrow points, the two arrows point at the same, exact same location. So this is sort of name over here. You can see this is a you know, hot, hot channel. I think it's a flux rope. So it's over here, but it's completely absent in the, uh, in the core temperature. In core temperature, what do you see? You see a cavity over here. And then you see the overlying field. Those are overlying potential or strapping field. And but they are the overlying field. They, they those fields are pushed away by the rising um, hot channel over here. So uh, this paper had a news release, um, and I got a many attention in multiple uh, newsletters. Here is a kinematic property uh, of the uh, of that structure. So we have carefully traced the leading front of two structures. Why is the hot channel, the EUV hot channel, the, this blue line, the, uh, this red line over here, and the other one, this the hot temperature feature, this one, and also the uh, the core temperature feature is a, is a, is a, is an overlying strapping field, leading edge over here. The, this 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 blue line, this line over here. So this is the uh, height height term for the overlying strapping field. This is for the uh, the flux loop or the hot channel, and uh, you can see the hot channel appears first, and then only after the impulsive phase, after the onset of the impulsive phase, um, the, the 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 overlying field become compressed. Then you can see the uh, the, the 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 change of the height of, of overlying field. Initially, before the before the onset of the flare, the initiation phase, you can see only see the rise up of the of the flux loop. But not the rise up of the overlying field. If you compare the velocity of the flux of the red line here, so this is the velocity of the flux of, and this is the, the blue line here is the velocity of the uh, of the overlying field, and uh, the the the, uh, the 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 black line here is the ghost soft X-ray profile, and the the other two lines here is hard X-ray, and um, hard X-ray flare and um, counts photon counts. So you can see that. The here is the slow rise phase. You know the the uh, the the, the uh, flux of rise slowly. You know the speed is, but it's not, it's not extremely slow. The speed is already like almost 40, 50 kilometers kilometers per second. Then after the immediately after the onset of flare, the velocity takes off quickly, increase within 
look at time scale. Within only five minutes from here to here, it reaches a speed of 600 kilometers per second. So extremely impulsive acceleration. In five minutes, it reached 600 kilometers per second. There are many data points that uh, are tracked here because of the, thanks to the STO uh, AIA high cadence observations, every, every 12 seconds. So in, in five minutes, you know, from here to here, uh, if, you, if you assume you use LASCO or e, uh, the, the uh, uh, stereo EUVI or the uh, so SOHO MDI, uh, so SOHO EIT, you cannot see such a detailed observation because the killer is five minutes, 12 minutes, but now it's 12 seconds. So you can see that how detailed the evolution of the velocity change with time and compared with the ghost X-ray. Again, I would say the evolution of the flux slope and the ghost X-ray is more or less synchronized. Um, this is another case of the flux slope. Uh, the previous one, you, you know, I would say is kind of a, a side of you. If you look at the other flux slope, you know, the, uh, this one is November the 3rd, 2010 event. You, you, if you look at along the axis of the flux slope, you know, it appears as a blob in the corona. So this is a hot temperature, 171, 171 channel, 10 million degree. If you could do cool temperature, such as a 94 channel is a 6 million degree, the flux of or the blob is less outstanding. It's, fending, it's fading into the background in the, in the warm temperature, middle temperature. Then if we move to cool temperature, say this is a, uh, about 2 million degree from the, uh, the, the 211 channel, you don't see the, the hot blob anymore. You don't see the flux of anymore. What you see is this overlying cool field lines are pushed up by, by the rising flux slope. Again, so this is a cool leading front uh, of the CME. So this leading front is not flux slope itself. It's just uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the compressed front, the compressed front by the, by the rising flux slope. Uh, the deeming region here, also the deeming region, but the flux slope is embedded, the hot flux slope is embedded inside of the core, uh, the core surrounding the lines. So, I mean, the, the, the STO is, 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 a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a useful in instrument to identify and observe flux of directly. You now, that's explaining why, you know, we have been, have so observations for 20 years, right? We have stereo observations since 2006, but we have never identified a flux of from those EUV observations before. The reason is because both SOHO and stereo, they don't have a hot, temp hot, hot channel. They only have the the, uh, the pass band up to about three million degree, but only the STO AIA they have channels about six million degree and ten million degree. So I think you know that is uh, the, the the indication that if we we want to observe flux slopes directly using EUV observations, we do need hot lines instead of core lines. Were there any resting observations facilities? Pardon. I mean, were there any resting observations? Could you see high Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. We have some comparison, but not, uh, not here. What XRT? XRT, XRT, no, XRT is a cadence issue and a sensitivity issue. It's not, it's, it's, they're not good enough to catch the flux. So. so this is another example of the flux loop. Um, um, happened on last year, the May 22nd, 2013. So this is only, I only show you the, uh, the 131 hot channel, 10 million degree. Um, so you can see what's rising up over here is not the overlying field or cool, cool loop lines. What's rising up here is the hot plasma. It's, it's about 10 million degree. And you can see that it rises up continuously and push out. It's unlike any flux, it, it doesn't exist before the eruption. And it only happens, you know, a you know, little bit before and, uh, and during the, the flare onset. The one thing you can notice is that... Can you, can you see when does the impulsive rate start? This one, I would say, I don't, I don't, have, in, I don't have this in, in, my, in, in the top of my head. But, uh, but, uh, but one thing you can notice is that in the very beginning, uh, you know, the flux of it doesn't lie high in the corona. It's very, very close to the surface. Basically, 
the flux loop is just hiding, hiding in the active regions, lie down. Okay. It's, it's not like you know cavity. Cavity, you assume the flux loop is already happily you know you know sitting in the high corona for a long time already. But for this case of active region flux loop, they are not necessarily they have already in the high corona already. They they are very close to the photosphere or transition region. And when it happens, become unstable, they just rise up. You are saying that you can see them before the flare. So the very initial phase of this would be before the process. Before the flare, you know, if it's if it too much before the flare, you want to see it because it's not heated yet. It's only like ten, a few minutes before the flare, it's, or it's, it's become heated, you can see it. But when you see it, it's not a semi it's just a sigmoidal shape. But only a few minutes before the, uh, before the onset of the flare. But before it heats up, you're saying it's not visible in the other lines? Not, not visible at all. It's not, at all. Not, not visible in any line before, the, before the flare. I, th I think th th this, yeah, it's, it should be consistent with the model because the model standard specify high density in flux loop, right? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, this comes back to your question of what's the flux loop? High magnetic field, low density structure, low in it's so low, it's so low line, and uh, it's, it's so low, and also, you know, because active region background is very strong. Noise, uh, not noise, it's active region emission background is very strong. So if it's so low in, in, the, in all emissions, because density is not, 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 not very high, so you don't see that. Even though they, the flux of is sitting, hiding in the low corona, but it's not illuminated. What you see here is because they, they are illuminated up to 10 million degrees. Because active region temperature plasma emission is about two million degree, so once you have this kind of emission ten million degree, it become outstanding. When they are illuminated, you can start to see it. That's the reason you know don't, you don't see it you know before the flare long time before the flare ten minutes earlier roughly, or uh, you don't see them in core core pass band. And the heating then has got to be coming from What's causing the heating? Is there some kind of reconnection happening that's the very slow rise, or was it's not above the background of the uh, that's, that's something is, I'm, 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 I'm thinking this question, and I want to talk with Zihan about it. You know, what's the heating source of the flux loop? Uh, because you know, there's a one example I show later. You know, uh, it's interesting that I have an additional heating source. It's, it's not flare. Here, you see the, the, the very bright region here? This is the, the flare region. Uh, the uh, the close to the chrome sphere and also the flare loops the, the the flare loops the flare loops only rise up to this height just like probably 0.1 sort of radii that's all the flare loops cannot rise too far so flare loops will just very close to the surface very bright and the flux loop can rise freely all the way into the heliosphere so the heating source I will, I will show you one the other example then probably can discuss about it. Uh, this will become a CME and, and it moves up. And, uh, and also, you know, if you observe the, the other channel, you know, some surrounding field, the core, the core plasma will be compressed over here. <coughs> so this is the, well, when you have flux swap, you have eruption, you have CMEs. This is one example, it's called a failed flux swap eruption. So this is just one example, and um, we, we do have eruption, and um, however, this eruption does not end up with a CME. It's just a, you know, uh, here's the possibility of the flux of it rise up in hot temperature. In cool temperature, you know, it's just a cavity over here. You know, in cool temp this is a hot temperature, the cool temperature over here. In cool temperature, you don't see much, except the overlying, overlying field is pushed up a little bit, and, uh, but still a cavity over here. But, but the in core temperature, you do see some kind of, you know, the inflow, you know, the plasma is, is flowing towards, the, you can see this part here, the plasma is flowing towards the center, probably indicating, you know, the, the, the evacuation of the flux soap from this area, then this, this, these surrounding fields are pushed into the uh, current sheet. Um, this field eruption uh, happened in January 5th, 2013. 
and it doesn't result in a CME. However, it produced a long duration flare. So it's a long duration flare, but there's no CME. So but this is actually is a flux super eruption. Uh, it doesn't have a CME because the too strongly overlying field. We have made the analysis of the uh, kinematics. So this is a high time of the overlying field. So this high time of the of the, the flux super blob. And if you can compare this high time, this velocity time, if you can compare, you know, this is the velocity of the flux rope. The rise up, rise up in only just in, in two minutes, in two minutes, it's from zero velocity to almost 400 kilometers per second, in two minutes. From zero velocity to, 200, to, to 400 kilometers per second. But however, immediately when it hits the uh, overlying field over here, that's the overlying field appeared, overlying field appeared to be compressed. Then, the velocity starts to decrease quickly. In a few minutes, it came to a complete stop. The overlying field is pushed up a little bit, and then they had a, a small velocity, about 50 kilometers per second, then also came to a stop. So this is, this is a situation in the flux of, you know, became unstable, uh, was accelerated at high speed, then came to a sudden stop. So this event, did this uh, region erupt later in the day? I ask you because K Core back in early mm -hmm. July of this year, yeah. we saw prominence come up at about close to 400 kilometers per second and get mm -hmm. up to 1.5 solar radii and yeah. stop. Mm -hmm. And then later in the day, it, the whole region erupted hours later. Mm -hmm. And when you look at Lasco, it was a slow rising structure that just went out. Yeah. So I was just curious if this went out. It's very similar. I, I don't know. I, I didn't follow follow yeah. this one. That's a very short time period. It's very short. It's just yeah. a few minutes. I was just curious. Yeah, yeah, I was just wondering if a few hours later if you saw the thing. No, I haven't checked. Okay. I, can, I, can, I can take a look yeah, at it. Yeah, because it's just interesting. I'll show you the one in July. Yeah, yeah. Gallup, yeah. Very similar. Hmm. It does go. The thing goes, but it doesn't go immediately. It's, yeah. it's a slow rising thing. Yeah. You know, if if there's no such uh, the AI observations, high cadence, you, you want to see anything, just, just see a flare, something. Just see a compact flare, and then that's it. Then you're wondering why this flare has its long duration, right? Is it such a non-CME flare, but it's long duration? But this is because of the flux loop. And also, if you look at the soft X-ray profile, if it's an eruption, you know the, the velocity will come, will continue to rise up all the way to the, you know, rise to the peak at the peak time. The soft X-ray will become constant. However, this one, the velocity peaked earlier, then came down to almost zero. And uh, this is a thermal property of this particular flare eruption. And uh, what you will see is that it's got a temperature map. So we, we calculate the temperature at each pixel of this eruption region, and then trace the temperature over time to see what happens. And uh, what happens is that is this. You see a giant fireball sitting in the corner for many hours. And um, that produces a long duration soft X-ray. Because a, a fireball sitting up for many years, the flare region close to the surface, only lasted about 10 minutes. This region over here, you can see a flash of high temperature, then disappear after 10 minutes. However, this fireball, you know, in the high corona, sitting there for like three or four hours, produced, you know, soft X-ray emission, a long duration flare. I don't think, you know, this, this giant fireball can be, can be explained by any traditional non-flux Scenario such as shield arcade. The shield arcade cannot r reach this height, first of all. Secondly, the shield arcade cannot have the heating lasting that long because the heating will be conducted to the surface immediately. But, so that comes to the, 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 the source of the heat of the flux loop. Flare has been gone for long already. The flare, only last, flare only lasted for 10 minutes, only produced this button over here. So what the mechanism keeps heating this structure in the high corona, very far away from the, from, the, from the surface for a long time. So if it's, it's not a reconnection, what's going on? So that's the question I, 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 I've been thinking about. So what is the mechanism of this continuing energy release for hours in, in the corona region? It's very far away from the surface. It's not corresponding to any impulsive re release of the uh, flare reconnection. Because the overlying 
But if it's reconnection, then the 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 if it's reconnection, then underneath the flare region has to have to have some response. But the flare region is nothing; just become quiet. But the only thing happening, you know, the, the heating going on, is in the top, not in the bottom. If it's a reconnection, yes, it happens in the impulsive phase. You see the brightening, both in the low corona and also in high corona. Yeah, this is impulsive. No, no, it's not impulsive. That's, that's, that's what I said. You know, the, 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 this heating here goes on for hours. The way after the, uh, the, the flare is gone. Uh, let me show you this, this is a temperature profile temperature profile of the two regions. Um, the, this black line, again, is the, uh, is the soft X-ray profile. The, uh, the, this line, the blue line here, is the temperature of the flare region close to the surface. So you can see the flare region, the temperature change, is a very, uh, it's very similar to the ghost X-ray profile. However, the temperature change, the temperature change of the flux soap is this. Is this is it's continue going on after the the temperature keeps rising even after the peak time of the of the of the flare peak then goes on slowly decrease and lasts longer than the uh, the flare impulsive phase. So it must be some additional heating source in the high corona that power the uh, the flux of heating. Right. Well, it, it'd be interesting if you look at like uh, the uh, Neve observations they'll show you mm -hmm. that in addition to this X-ray change, yeah. that they see quite a bit of heating going on mm -hmm. in other wavelengths yeah. that maybe just as well accounting for this. And it would still could be reconnection, but not necessarily the temperature of the girl's X-ray. Uh, I'm not sure it's a reconnection or dual heating or, or current dissipation. Because remember, the flux loop is a, 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 is a three-dimensional kind of channel, right? That kind of can, can keep dissipating, dual, dual dissipating. When it rises up, but it's not a reconnection of the, the flare reconnection in the kind of sheet underneath the flux, it may be the connection inside of the flux. So. So, anyway, let me let me move on because you know it's already eleven o five. I'm 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 almost done. Okay, this uh, last two slides. So the the conclusion is that you know energy released in solar flares is due to magnetic reconnection, most likely. The CME is due to magnetic flux loop, triggered by the torus instability and driven by Lorentz self force. And very often, the flares CMEs are associated with each other. It's likely that magnetic reconnection and flux loop instability reinforce each other through a positive feedback process. Here's the uh, one, one simple scenario uh, of solar eruptions. There are three kinds of solar eruptions. Uh, confined flare, there's no CME. Secondly, is an eruptive flare. It's associated with the CME. It's have, you have flare, CME. So, so the one, no flare. Only CME, a cold CME. You, know. you, you do see a CME erupts, but you don't see a flare. Okay, there are three types of the events happening in the sun in solar eruption. And I think, you know, majority will be like this. Then a significant number of like, will be like this, but a small portion like this. Um, then how to explain all three types of the eruptions? Here's the idea, um, my simple way to explain it. You know, all of them come from the energized magnetic field, right? That's no, no argument about it. But how do you produce the uh, confined flare? Well, if you have a kind of channel, whatever the kind of channel is formed, you know, emerging or shearing or flux of eruption, it will trigger the, the, the current sheet, uh, become unstable, trigger the reconnection, then produce a flare. Um, to produce a, a, a CME, a, a CME is not a flare, you know, you just need a, the, uh, presence of the magnetic flux loop, then somehow the torus instability happens, they have a CME. So this can happen independently, you know, just go this path, go this path. But very often what's happening is kind of a feedback process. That is, if you have a baby kind of sheet, have a baby flux loop in the, in the act region, one thing happens will affect the other one. Uh, if you have a kind of sheet, you have a reconnection, 
this week next thing we'll convert the the overlying say shield arcade into uh, the the poly poloid flux of flux of, will reinforce the strength in the flux of um, helicity for example then the flux will rise up and uh, and uh, trigger the torus instability but once torus instability triggered you know it will drag the magnetic field underneath and will strengthen the current sheet then will then will strengthen the reconnection and this process goes on in a cycle we produce the um, the so-called eruptive flares so I think you know in the corona in the sun all the three things happen depending what the kind of configuration you have in the act region if if the the configuration the pre eruption configuration is dominated by the current sheet only then you map end up with the uh, uh, flare only but it's, it's dominated the energy is dominated by a flux loop then you may end up with a CME. Uh, if the you know you have both kind of sheet and also the flux will exist at the same in the same region but close to each other, then they may reinforce each other and produce the uh, the eruptive flares with CMEs. I think that's the uh, my kind of personal idea about it, and that's all for my talk. Thank you. Yeah, we can. And um, I have a quick question. So how long are you here? Um, <laughs> <laughs> he can only be here for the day. Just for the day. I'm leaving at four o'clock. Yes, thank you. But his student is here. Um, <laughs> and she'll be here for a whole week from today till next Wednesday, working with Sarah, and not working on some conference. She will talk about a corner cavity from AI observations um, on Friday. But she's sitting in the office of how to call from Sarah. Yes. She started all the cavities from the uh, ST observations, 400 of them. So you will talk about it. Any good question? Yes. Yes. So can you explain that from this? I think you know, that means you know, if you have the uh, if you have the uh, a lot of energy in the corona, which 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 is able to produce the intense flares, then it likely to trigger this feedback process. And uh, so, if you have strong flare, you know you, you can convert a lot of the uh, shield flux into the poloidal flux that produce the uh, the uh, flux soap. You know, but you have to have this kind of baby flux soap exist over there. If you have no flux soap at all. Just kind of sheet. You, you want to have the uh, uh, a CME. That will be the case of 10% of X class flares has no CME. They just don't have anything similar to flux in the reconnection region. But if you have some small flux over there already, then likely you have strong reconnection going on in X class flares. Then we'll convert some some background flux into the flux loop, then produce CME CMEs. But if less energetic, you know, you have high. If it's less energetic, you don't have enough flux to be, if you don't have the, if less energetic, you know, the reconnection is, is, is weak, you don't convert enough flux into flux so, to produce reaction. Well, I'll just, yeah, quickly say, I think, I think these, I think flux rope, in my opinion, uh, I just want to make a comment, I think flux rope and mm -hmm. current sheets are working mutually, um, um, both present throughout the, both the quantum static phase and, the, you know, building up the current yeah, sheet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is, Contributing to the building of the flux rope. Yeah. I think what you see, the hot channel, I actually see in the models, mm -hmm. that hot channel is part of the flux rope, it's the heated part of the flux rope, just yeah. the QL cell formation yeah. Yeah. during the quite static phase. Yeah. But we can talk about it later. So. Yeah, I'm aware of the, yes, yeah. your idea. Uh, anyway, so. So I guess I, I agree with you that, you know, when you have act region, right? When the act region emerges and also evolves, you know, she shearing motion, they produce all kinds of interesting corner structures, including kind of sheet and all flux rope. You know, the how they distribute, how how much energy is in kind of sheet, how much energy is in flux loop, you know, because they are currents, right? Just depending on the the, the the topology of the current. So what kind of topology of currents will determine the fate of the reaction? Any more questions? Let's thank the speaker again.